I've done this. <laughs> yeah, I know. I Welcome back. I've done this seven hours already. Well, welcome back. What we're going to do today, you know, I was really impressed. I was like, oh, no, I'm probably falling behind. We're exactly on schedule for our lectures. Today we're going to be studying Kirchhoff's laws and how to solve circuits. And I want to end with one thing about adding capacitors in series and parallel. So this is the last slide we had about the energy stored in capacitors. What was the purpose of a capacitor as I related it to you? To store energy in either the form of a charge separation. It doesn't store charge. The net charge of the capacitor should be zero. But you have a separation of charge, some charge here, some charge there. And by separating that charge, you're storing energy. So one way is by charge separation. The other way of saying it is by creating an electric field. And the two are fundamentally the same because you have separated charge, it creates an electric field going from one to the other. So the potential energy stored, one half capacitance times voltage squared. The voltage is the voltage difference from one side of the capacitor to the other. Or you could put one half charge squared over capacitance where the charge is the charge on one plate with one plate being positive that and one plate being negative that. So we had two ways of writing it that we worked out in class, not yesterday, but on Wednesday. We're not doing wood clap. What must be the same if you have two resistors in series? One of these three things has to be the same for two resistors in series. Which one is it? If they are in series, I'm asking this because A, we're going to be using it, and B, it's a really important concept for circuits. In circuit, whoops, didn't mean to do that. In circuits, we have charge going through. What do we call the charge going through? I, the current. And so if it's in series, that current has no choice but to go through both items. So the current must be the same. So the current through each resistor is the same. Come on in. Welcome. This is the Campion Academy science physics teacher. We'll call him Mr. Cost. <laughs> that is how you pronounce it, right? Or for those of us who are Americans, Mr. Cast, because, you know. So if you have two resistors in series, they have to have the same current because when we're talking about current, we're literally talking about electrons going through those resistors. And any electron that goes through one goes through the next one. Now, one thing to keep in mind, that little confusing factor, because of Ben Franklin, if my current is going as shown with my arrow, what are the electrons doing? They're going the opposite way. Why is that Ben's fault? Ben said whatever is on this amber, Greek word electron, is going to have a negative charge. And since it turns out the stuff that moves is those negative charges, the electrons, then when we talk about current, the rate at which charge flows, Implicit in that is it's the direction that positive charge flows, and what's really moving is negative charge. So it's reversed. So you have the same current. What about the voltages then? What is the voltage? Voltage Potential energy per charge. So each electron has a certain potential energy. And so how is the voltage across these two resistors going to compare? That's how much energy do electrons lose going through one compared to going through the other? They do lose a certain amount in each resistor. It depends on the resistance value and the current. So in this, if I have one that's 6 ohms and one that's 4 ohms, the one with 6 ohms is going to lose more energy for every electron that goes through. So the voltage drop, the energy loss per charge, is bigger for the 6 ohm resistor than the 4 ohm resistor. So the voltages are not necessarily the same. 
Obviously, if resistance one was resistance two, they would be. But the currents must be the same. And the power dissipated, remember, power is the current through the resistor multiplied by the voltage drop across the resistor. So since the voltages are different and currents are the same, the power is going to be different as well. So that was resistors in series. What makes resistors in series? Okay, that, that, would, that would be an outcome. I think you're probably thinking right, Max. When you have them connected so that the output side of one is the input side of the next and there is no other option. If I had something else here, not series anymore because there's another option. But when there's no option but going from one to the next, that makes them series. Now, resistors in series, we talked about how we add resistors in series. And we said, well, we have the same current in both resistors. And so voltage total, and we're going to learn later in today, this is actually an application of Kirchhoff's voltage law. The voltage total is the voltage across one plus the voltage across two. But since they have the same current, I can use Ohm's law, V equals IR, to put this in terms of the current. If I have an equivalent resistor, it's equivalent if it has the same voltage and the same current. And so I'm going to have the voltage total is the current times the resistance equivalent is equal to that voltage total. But notice I have I in every term in this equation. So all I have to do is divide out the I's. And I have R equivalent is equal to R1 plus R2. Now we did that in lab. Let's go to the capacitors. What's going to be the same for two capacitors? Actually, I, I think I have a slide after this with a question. What's going to be the same for two capacitors that are in series? That's a good question? Yes. Okay. If they're in a series, isn't it? I, I think. Because capacitance, the ratio between. <laughs> Somewhere I have a picture to go with. Well, maybe I didn't put that picture in then. There. Back to here. Okay, so let's think this through. We start off with two capacitors that have no charge on them, okay? So we have no charge, and I connect it to a battery. Battery, I put two cells. Notice the difference in the capacitor symbol and the battery symbol. The capacitor symbol is two parallel plates of the same length. Now, that's not the only capacitor symbol. There is also a capacitor symbol that's like this with one of them curved in that case you have a dielectric and it only works correctly if you put positive on the straight one so those are dielectric capacitors with that marking so if you see that you won't see it in my class but if you see that it's another kind of capacitor that is has a dielectric and you can only put it one way in your circuit for it to work right <laughs> okay so which side is positive on my battery the long side. Okay, we got that down. So in terms of charge, if this top side is positive, what's it going to do to the top plate of capacitor one? I'm going to go the other way. Because it's positive, it's going to try to draw in electrons, right? And so as it draws in electrons, it's going to take electrons away from this plate, making it positive. And so I'm going to have a plus Q there. Now, a battery doesn't create charge. It doesn't store charge. What does a battery do? We have a chemical reaction that actually gives energy to the charge. So charge goes in one side, it comes out the other side with more energy. 
It's very much like a pump. In fact, historically, scientists said, ooh, it's doing work on the charge. So what does work force? And so they said that battery is a source of electromotive force. It's a force that causes motion to charge. Read the word backward and tells you what they were saying. Then they later decided, you know, that wasn't a very good description. It's not right. It's not putting a force on the charge per se, but it's giving it energy. And yet we use that term EMF for electromotive force all the time to describe the voltage of a battery. So we'll write this with a little script E that stands for EMF, electromotive force, that's equal to the voltage of the battery. So it's just taking charge and giving it energy and moving it. It's pumping the charge. So any plus Q that went out the positive side, of course, we always have to remember, plus Q out the positive side, now that was electrons that came into the positive side in reality. But those electrons that came in the positive side were then dumped out the negative side. So where are those electrons going to end up that were pulled away from the top of capacitor plate one? Or capacitor one top plate? The battery doesn't store them, so where are they going to go? It almost sounded like you said it right there, Krista, but was it yawn or were you speaking? It was yawn. It was yawn, okay. Claudia, yes. I made that mistake last time. I'm so sorry. Steve Nazario's daughter. I get her and Steve Nazario's daughter, Krista, confused. It's going to go around so the bottom of capacitor 2 has that same magnitude of charge, but it's negative. Because the battery wasn't storing it, it was just moving it. Now let's look at what's happening in between. If I have a negative charge on the bottom of capacitor 2, what is it doing to charge on the top of that capacitor? If it's negative, then it's going to be repelling electrons and making it more positive. So this side here is going to become positive. What about up here where you have a positive charge? What's it doing to the other side? It's attracting electrons up there, making it negative. And you have no electrical connection between the two sides of the capacitor plates. So you have no charge that went from here to here. So if you started with this neutral between these two plates, they have to remain neutral. So what's going to happen is you're going to have the lower plate has a plus Q on the top. The upper plate has a minus Q on the bottom. Each capacitor has the same charge. So a rule, unless you have something that happens bad in your circuit, no, no current passes through a capacitor. But you have current that flows in on one side, flows out on the other because it charges up. So it's like if it goes from one capacitor to another. Like it doesn't go from one capacitor to the other. Correct. Does it? Because when I when you say it doesn't transfer them, I think so then it bounces between them. It redistributes, but it doesn't pass across. So any electron that was, I'll change color here. Any electron that was in this purple box stayed in this purple box. And any electron that was outside stayed outside of that purple box. But the charge redistributed because the battery made the top of capacitor 1 positive and the bottom of capacitor 2 negative. And then that caused the charge in between to redistribute as well. Yes? How do we know that the top plate of capacitor 1 is positive? Because that was connected to the positive terminal of the battery. So if it was connected the other way, it would have been negative. That, that's <laughs> it's an important question. Now, we showed how we added resistors in series here. Now we want to see how we add capacitors in series. So what's the same for the capacitors in series? What do both those two capacitors have to have that's the same? Charge. Charge. So we have... Same Q, 
in both. And so notice before, if it was the same current, then we added up the voltages. If it's the same charge now, we're going to add up the voltages. So we're going to have, again, for series, it's always voltage total. It's equal to voltage 1 plus voltage 2. For capacitor, the relationship between voltage and charge and capacitance, well, that's the definition of capacitance, is Q equals VC. Solve that for V. V is equal to Q over C. So now if I substitute just like I did for the resistor, but now I'm doing it for char or for voltage, excuse me, then I'll have voltage one is Q divided by capacitance one. And what about voltage two? What would that be? Q over capacitance two. And for the total, it would be the same charge. If I have an equivalent capacitor, it's going to have to have the same charge to so the same voltage. Q over capacitance total. Once again, I have Q in every term, so I'm just going to cancel those Qs. And I have 1 over capacitance total is equal to 1 over C1 plus 1 over C2. So capacitors in series add with the same equation that resistors in parallel did. If I have two resistors in series, does that make a bigger or smaller resistance? Resistors the right side. Can you the question? If I have two resistors in series, does that make a bigger or smaller equivalent resistance? Bigger. bigger. If I have two capacitors in series, does that make a bigger or smaller capacitance? Small. Smaller. Smaller, right. So they, they're working in reverse that way. So now we're going to go to parallel. If we have two resistors in parallel, what has to be the same? It's not the current now. It's not the current because you have I coming in and it can split between two possible pathways. So it doesn't split anymore? Doesn't have to, no. It's the voltage because what makes them in parallel? Go ahead, Sorry. Claudia. Can I like go back to what we just said? They add just like if we put resistors in series. If you put capacitors in series, they add like resistors in parallel. Oh, uh, so that's why. So it's that's why. It's the opposite result. Right. Okay, that makes sense. Sorry, thank you. Okay, what makes these resistors in parallel instead of in series? The tops are connected together, and like what? Whoops, that was the wrong button. Likewise, their bottoms are connected together, which means that the energy difference per charge has to be the same across both of them, because it's like you're going from the top of the cliff to the bottom of the cliff. It doesn't matter what pathway you take, it's still the same change in energy per mass of your body. It's the same change in energy per charge in an electric circuit. And what do we call the energy per charge? Voltage. So they have to have the same voltage. Now let me go back and make sure I circled the right one and the other. Of course I went. Yeah. So I had to make sure I circled the right one there. Sometimes I have these brain collapses. So they have to have the same voltage. Current is not necessarily the same. Think of it with the water pipe analogy. If you had a really big water pipe and a small pipe, which would have more water going through it if you're draining from the same tower? The big one would. Same thing here. If you have a small resistance, that's the same as a big diameter pipe, and a, and a large resistance, that'd be small, you'd have a lot more current that goes through the small resistor, the one that's like a big pipe. So <clears throat> I decided to do <laughs> the capacitor case as a special one here. If I have two capacitors that are in parallel and I can connect them to a power supply, What's the same for these two capacitors? It, I know it says it right there. Same charge? No, that was series. My words here. Yes, my picture is parallel. My words here are for series. So it's a true statement for series. 
But for parallel, that's right. So Dolly is a so I I probably have another slide where I wrote the words I meant for this one somewhere unless I deleted it so if they're in parallel instead of having the same charge they're gonna have the same voltage because just like the resistors in parallel this side was connected together and likewise this side was connected together so the voltage difference across them has to be the same. What about the charge? Just like with the resistor, if you have the same voltage, your charge, the resistor, your current can be different. So we're going to have different charges, but the same voltage. So with the same voltage, V1 equals V2 equals the V equivalent. So I'll just call that V. And then using my equation, Q is equal to VC, I'm going to have Q total. Q total is the total charge that went and split between these two. So which side of this power supply is the positive side? The long one. So this is positive. So that means this is going to be plus Q2. This will be plus Q1 because they're connected to the positive terminal of the battery. And this would be minus Q1 minus Q2 because they're connected to the negative terminal. And notice Q1 is the charge on both sides of the capacitor 1. Q2 is the charge on both sides of capacitor 2. So my Q total, the total charge that left my power supply is the charge on capacitor 1 plus capacitor 2. So using that equation, I'm going to have VC total is equal to VC1 plus VC2. And our last step is probably obvious to everyone. We cancel those Vs, and we have for capacitors in parallel, C total is equal to C1 plus C2. That's adding like resistors did in series. And this one's actually easy to explain by our equation for capacitance. Remember the equation for capacitance, the physical capacitance based on how you constructed it was C is equal to kappa, the dielectric constant, epsilon zero, the permittivity of free space, times the plate area divided by the plate separation. If I have these capacitors in parallel, I might as well have just connected, whoops, I don't know what my hand did there. I might as well have just connected these plates together and these plates together to make it so my area was the sum of the two areas, which would then make this a bigger capacitance, the sum of the two areas, if the Ds are the same. So you can see, yeah, that makes sense that the capacitances add up when you put them in parallel. We've already worked through, we worked through this in lab. We just finished that, so skip this slide. And get to how we deal with real circuits and real batteries. Now, going back to our description of how a, an electric cell, a voltaic cell works, you have a chemical reaction. And when you're not using the cell, the chemical reaction will create a voltage difference depends on the actual chemistry of the cell. So there's cells with different chemical reactions. But it's typically around one and a half volts for the cell. But as soon as you connect that cell to something, so, you know, like calculator, as soon as I turn on the calculator and I start using energy from that cell, then the voltage drops a little and the chemical reaction has to kick in to replenish it. So the voltage drops when I start to use it. In electric circuits, for a real circuit, we model that by saying there is a little internal resistance. So this green dashed box is what we call, I'm going to write the word battery. I know it's a single cell here. The battery is that box. So it has a terminal voltage. 
of this here, this is supposed to be a script E, of the EMF, and then minus the voltage drop through that resistor. Now notice I drew a little arrow here for current. I have current coming out of positive, going into negative. But our sign convention is that when charge goes through the resistor, it loses energy. So, <laughs> so the positive side is the side the current entered. The negative side is the side it exited. And so notice that's the opposite direction of the positive and negative on my cell, hence the minus sign. I times that internal resistance. Ideally, if your battery is in good condition, that internal resistance is a small number. That is, you don't have a very big voltage drop when you start using current. But if your chemical reaction is no longer working efficiently, the voltage will drop much more, which would manifest in this model as the internal resistance rising. So that's why, once again, if you're testing a battery to see if it's good, you don't just measure its voltage when it's not being used. You measure its voltage when it's being used, and you measure how much it dropped when it was being used. So in our circuits, we often will have these lowercase r's next to our ideal cell or battery symbol. And that's to indicate that it's a real battery with some internal resistance. Now, if I were to ask you what's the current flowing through the circuit, you should be able to answer using Ohm's law. I have a circuit and the current, according to Ohm's law, is V over R. And since I have these two resistors in series, I add them by just summing them up. And so I have the EMF, remember that was supposed to be a script E, over R of the load plus the internal resistance. So this is an easy circuit to solve. This is a circuit like what you did in lab Tuesday. This is not the kind of circuit you're going to see on the MCAT exam, for instance. You're going to see more complicated circuits that you can't do something simple like this with. So our goal today is to get to that level of competence. Yeah, today. Also, lab next week, we will be working on this. So this is something that we have through next Tuesday before I'm going to expect high competence from you. What would you do if you had this circuit here? Cry. Okay, that's that's a valid option. I like that option. David is a, is a <laughs> kind of person who likes to see people cry, apparently. No, no, no. I would be oh, crying. okay, okay. Do you, do you add the inverse of the parallel series to... <laughs> <laughs> He's making up stuff. No, no, I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm asking if you, you add, add the ohms up, except for the parallel part, you'd be the inverse. Okay. The, the, the answer is a fundamental yes. You combine, you combine the resistors in series or parallel to simplify the circuit, and you can solve this one. We're only going to do one example that we can solve this way because... You can't do this with most circuits either. So if I look at this, can you identify any resistors that are either series or parallel with another resistor? Yes. Okay, I heard first answer was Max. He said two and three. What kind of relationship do I have between two and three? Parallel. So I can replace resistors two and three with R equivalent. So one over R equivalent is one over R2 plus one over R3, right? The reason I always use it in this form is we could have had three resistors in parallel and the equation just continues. You'll see this written in the form that only works with two resistors as R equivalent equals R2, R3 over R2 plus R3. <laughs> that's an R, not a B. And that's a three, not a two. That is correct for two resistors. If you have more than two, you're just better off to do it the way that I've been doing. So to avoid confusion, I just do it one way. So I'm going to take this, I'm going to put in the numbers. 1 over 6.00 ohms plus 1 over 13.0 ohms. 
1 over 6 plus 1 over 13. What's the common denominator? Um, 6 times 13. <laughs> so that's equal to 19 over 78. So that's 1 over our equivalent. So our equivalent is 78 ohms over 19, which, I don't know, it's between 3 and 4? That's four point what? Um, so just so people understand, this was one over our equivalent. So going from here to here, bad hand. Going from here to here, I simply inverted to get our equivalent on top. So we have that is four point one oh five ohms. Now I'm going to rewrite the circuit. That is correct. <laughs> he, he is not unashamed to announce his genius. What was that? Where did the 19 come from again? The 19 over 78 ohms? Um, when you get a common denominator, it, it's... Hey, don't mess. Don't mess. <laughs> okay. So now these are in now these are in series. How do I add resistors? How do I add resistors in series? Okay, so I'm going to do R total is equal to R1 plus R equivalent. So that's going to be 1.00 ohms plus that's ohms plus 4.105 ohms equals 5.105 ohms. Because I'm some kind of mathematical genius to be able to add those numbers. Okay, so I'm looking at the green circuit now. The green circuit is redrawing the original circuit after we've combined the two parallel resistors. Okay, so okay, can we like go back to the first one and how we combine stuff? Okay. <laughs> like, let's just start from the beginning. <laughs> we recognize, well, Max recognized. This is connected together. This is connected together. So those two resistors are in parallel, okay. those two alone. And so that's what this work was doing was replacing R2 and R3 with an equivalent resistance. So then I redrew my original circuit, but I replaced those two that are in parallel with R equivalent. And that was in series with R1, so my last step was adding them in series. Dave. It. <laughs> Instead of resistors, they were capacitors. Would we do the vice versa equation? Yeah, I think like in the future, if we're gonna like, especially with, like these like, complex ones, if you can give us a, like a worksheet of this so that we can like write on that. So, do like, I, do I not have these on the worksheet? Like, no, like, like, yeah, like, the worksheets are on the middle there we go. for the entire semester. Yeah. No, the work the worksheets for preparing for the test. Okay. Oh, so, so you have it written down in front of you already, so you're just... Exactly. I, I get exactly. Yeah. Okay. The yeah. resistor 1 over R parallel is on the uh -huh. So is the R1 equal to R2? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. But the capacitor is on the other side. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just trying to think about how we can like combine the two so that we can like have a worksheet for each different section. Because they're capacitors, not resistors. Okay, I can continue. <laughs> So, what have I done so far? I simplified just the resistors. I haven't found any currents yet. But now if I have a circuit that just has one resistor, now after I've done this final calculation, I can say that my circuit is equivalent to a 12-volt power supply with a 5.105 ohm resistor. How much current is flowing through that 5.105 ohm resistor? I is V over R, right.
There are no capacitors in the circuit. We'll cover that on Monday. We we have not covered that. We'll cover it on Monday. Yes, but there are no resistors in those circuits. Okay. So if we do this, 12 divided by 5.105, what is that? 2.25? 3.5. So we have 2.35 amps is the current going through right here. Now we go backward. That's the current going through here. So that's the current through resistor one. But that current is being split between currents two and three here. But if we know that current of 2.35 amps is going through this one ohm resistor, then I can also calculate its voltage drop is 2.35 amps times 1 ohms. Ohm's law v equals IR. And so that voltage is 2.35 volts since 1 times 2.35. That's, that's how much it's going to drop across this resistor. And now that I know it's dropping in that across that resistor, if I go up 12 and go down 2.35, what's remaining? If I, if I go up 12 volts from the battery and then I have a drop of 2.35 volts from the first resistor, what's remaining is 9.65 volts for these two. And so the final step, I can now find what those two currents are using Ohm's law I is V over R. So the 6 ohm resistor is going to be 9.65 volts divided by 6. And the 13 ohm resistor, 9.65 volts divided by 13. No, because they're parallel, it's the same voltage drop, but it's different currents. Right, the current, okay, look at the blue line, the blue arrows. The blue arrows, when you get there to the parallel ones, it splits. So you can't just, you can't just add them at the same time? I have to know how much each one is separate. I know those two do have to add to 2.35. They have to do them separately to find what they are. David. Can't you just take the 9.65 and multiply by the R equivalent? That, that would simply give me back my 2.35 amps. But I want to find how much goes through each one, not just what the total is through both. Oh, okay. So then with that city. Isabel first. How I got V1? Yeah. Yes. So I just use Ohm's law there. V equals IR. We, our calculation had gone through and found what the total current was, and that total current is all going through R1. And so then I calculate the voltage drop. And then we use what we will learn in a minute is Kirchhoff's voltage law to determine that it's 9.65 volts for the other two. And so I'm actually <laughs> going to go back a slide maybe. I2 is equal to that 9.65 volts divided by 6.00 ohms because R2 is 6 ohms. And I3, 9.65 volts over 13.0 ohms. Those are both just using I equals V over R. And so we get those two currents. What are those two currents? Somebody with the calculator out? And so if we add these two together, that's 2.35 amps, which is what it's supposed to be because we said it was 2.35 amps flowing through the pair of them. So we've now determined what the currents and voltages for everything in this circuit are. Okay, I get it. I get it. So we would say we solve the circuit now because we know the voltage and current everywhere in the circuit. Are these the type of problems oh, that are going to be extended? This question yes, is yes. Or harder? No, the next type. What? The hardest? This is, this is the navy one. 
<laughs> let's not call him the baby one. It, like it's that. the first step. The Maxwell. What does voltage drop mean? Okay, remember, voltage is the energy per tra charge. When a resistor is named a resistor because it resists charge going through, you have to do work on the charge to get it to go through. So and so that voltage drop is how much energy the charge loses as it goes through. It's not going to lose that every circuit. It's going to lose that. Well, it, it, we calculate the power. Power is equal to IV. And so the power, the energy per second that is being used is taking, for instance, this one ohm resistor. It has a voltage of 2.35 volts. It has a current of 2.35 amps. So it's 2.35 volts times 2.35 amps, which is, I don't know, five-ish watts five joules per second so every second that's how much energy is is being required to keep that current going we don't have one this semester but there is me and i will respond to emails i will be in my office i want to help you there's also free tutoring in do that? Huh? <laughs> no, I've never done it, but like one of my friends. And they have, they like offer to do like everything in the street, so like. Cool. Huh? Like this. Just park somewhere. That's a downtown, it's like 10 meters. Okay. <laughs> now to the complicated circuits. In this circuit, we don't have, well, we do have a couple of resistors that are in series. These are in series, right? And these are in series, even though there's a power supply between them, there's only one path through them. So we can combine those two resistors in series, but we can't combine those with R1 as series or parallel. We can't combine them with each other as series or parallel because series, there has to be no option that going from one through the next. We have other options. Parallel, the tops have to be connected together and the bottoms have to be connected together. We have power supplies to break that up. So this, we cannot simplify like we did the last one. So we have to do something else. And that something else requires that we learn Kirchhoff's two laws. Now, Gustav Kirchhoff, I think he was a genius because his two laws are very fundamental basic laws, but he's the one who said, hey, we could apply this here. So let's look at Kirchhoff's laws. First, first notice Kirchhoff's spelling. K-I-R-C-H-H-O-F-F -F is Kirchhoff. Kirchhoff has his first law, the Kirchhoff current law. And Kirchhoff's current law is a restatement of the law that charged cannot be created or destroyed. That is, you can't go from zero charge to plus one Coulomb. You can go from zero charge to zero charge with pair production, but it's still zero and zero. You didn't create a net charge. And so since current is charge per second, the charge per second that comes in is equal to the charge per second that leaves. Now this does have implied another rule. In our circuits, nothing can store charge. If you could store charge, then this would be broken. But since our circuits can't store charge in them, then all the charge that goes in has to leave. And so we have the current in is equal to the current out or the sum of the current at a node. What's a node? It's a new word. It's a what? Well, we learned the word last semester for the waves, right? Oh, yeah, that's but that was a different situation and thus a different definition. A node is any place where two elements meet. So technically, if I have two resistors, there's a node between them. But that node is really unimportant. So we actually call something like this an essential node. Essential nodes are the important ones. And essential nodes are where you have three or more wires coming together. So any place three or more wires come together, that's an essential node. 
And at that location, we will apply Kirchhoff's current law that says whatever comes in must go out. So if you look at this picture, what's coming in? Okay, I one. What's going out? I two and I three. So that means putting in the numbers just to verify, 11 amps must equal 7 amps plus 4 amps. In this form here, you simply decide, let's say N is positive. It's up to you. You can say N is positive or out is positive as long as one's positive, one's negative. So using the upper form, I would simply say 0 is equal to I1 minus I2 minus I3 which is 11 amps minus 7 amps minus 4 amps. So that's Kirchhoff's current law. That's pretty easy to do, right? That's very simple math. And yet, that's Kirchhoff's current law. So what is Kirchhoff's current law restatement of? Conservation. Charge. Conservation of charge. Charge cannot be created or destroyed. That's conservation in physics terminology. Well, he comes up with the second law. The second law, Kirchhoff's voltage law. Now remember, voltage is energy per charge. And so if you think about this, like, let's say you decide to hike up to the top of, oh, let's say Mount Princeton, because it's close to my house in Colorado. So you hike up to the top of Mount Princeton as soon as possible. And you go up one pathway, and it's really windy around and long, but you have a certain change in elevation. That's the same as your voltage. Right? Your voltage is your energy per charge. Elevation is your energy per mass. Then you come down just doing the direct route. You get back to your starting point. Did you have more change of potential energy when you went up or more change of potential energy when you went down? They're the same because the potential energy only had to do with your starting at any point, right? So if you start at the bottom and you end at the bottom, you're going to have the same potential energy you started with. doesn't matter what your path is. And so Kirchhoff said the same is going to have to be true for the electric circuits. If I start and I go through the circuit and I get back to my starting point, so if I come all the way around and get back to the starting point, my net change in energy per charge, i.e. my net voltage, had better be zero. And so we have the rule that says the sum of the voltage equals zero. Or you could write as the sum of the voltage rises equals sum of the drops. So I'm going to show an example here. And it turns out I'm not going to show you how to use a calculator today because we're not going to do that. That's the next slide. So I always start by drawing my current. So my current here... It's identified as 2 amps, but everything is given in this problem. This problem makes it too simple. But I draw my current for every resistor independently, just so I don't mess up. And then I use our rules for plus and minus. So which side is positive on this one? The side with the tail. I, I just went ahead and answered because it has 5 and 0. You could have just gone with those. The one with the tail is positive. The one with the tail is positive. So I've identified which side is positive and negative. Then for each resistor, I just I always start at the bottom left-hand corner simply so I won't make mistakes. Right? If I do the same way every time, I'm less likely to make an error. And if I start there, the first thing I'm going to do is go through a resistor. So if we didn't have all these numbers, if all we knew was the voltage of this and the resistor values. That's how you typically have your problem set up. Then I would say, okay, I started at zero. And then I'm going down because I went from positive to negative. That's a drop. I times R2 is what I had for the first one. I keep going. Now I get to my power supply. And that's a rise. I went from the negative side to the positive side. So plus my 18 volts. Now through this resistor, is it going up or down through the lowercase r, the internal resistance? It's going down, so minus i lowercase r, 
keep coming. The next thing I come to is R1. Is it going up or down for R1? Down. Down because it went from the positive side to the negative side. There's my equation. I've just made an equation applying Kirchhoff's voltage law. Now, in this case, it was a very simple circuit. You could have just simplified this combined resistors in series and been done, right? But we do it for the example to make it easy for you. But we have an equation now that we can use to solve for current if we knew the R values and the voltage. What law is Kirchhoff's voltage law based on? Conservation of energy this time. So the Kirchhoff current law was based on conservation of charge. Kirchhoff voltage law, conservation of energy, two things that are pretty basic, but they give you the tools for solving a circuit. So this is where we will start on Monday. We'll solve circuits using this step, this set of steps. We will go through, and I'll show you how to use matrix methods on your calculator to go from, well, here's the set of equations you get, putting it into a matrix like this, and then using our REF function, get your answers, which turns out is real simple. Question, Max? Um, we won't have, we'll have homework on the stuff that we did, not on the, we will have, okay, it takes forever to go backward. We will have homework on everything before the slide. All right, have a happy Sabbath.